Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Julia Armstrong. I'm a member of the board of the Culinary Historians of Canada. And now I'd like to turn it over to uh, John Oda, CHC member and author of the highly acclaimed recent publication, The Kitchen. Thank you, Julia. Elizabeth Baird's love and passion for the Canadian food scene has resulted in a career that has spanned decades and resulted in countless cookbooks, television appearances, editing and writing assignments. She has written and edited more than 25 cookbooks and has been honored with a plethora of awards, including the Order of Canada. She does a mountain of volunteer work, including for the Hospital for Sick Children, and is a volunteer cook at the Fort York National Historic Site. Welcome, Elizabeth Baer. So, Elizabeth, the first question today is, behind every great cook is a great mother. True or false? I think that's true. And it's help, if it's a great mother, it also helps that it, the, great mo that the mother is a great cook, so, or at least very, very passionate about food and cooking, so, and what, how important that is to our lives. So my, and my mother was, um, was a, a, a nurse, and uh, she grew up on a farm uh, near Mitchell, Ontario. And this, this is my mother, uh, and my father on their wedding day, my mother weighed, she was tall and slim and very beautiful. And my father loved to eat, so they made a great pair. <laughs> he was also very affectionate, which was very nice, because I always associate that with people who like to eat and who enjoy food. Yes, isn't that nice? Right. So, so we grew up in, a, I grew up in Stratford, Ontario, and um, we had, we had a, an enormous garden at the back of our house. It was in the 40s when I was growing up. And um, we did a lot of preserving. My mother made chili sauce. We made dill pickles. We made bread and butter pickles. We made mustard, um, mustard pickles. And, but I think one of the important things that she made was either the seven, nine, or 11-day pickles, which were in a giant crock in the fruit cellar. We had an actual room in the, in the cellar, which was kept cool, where we kept bushels of, of uh, apples and carrots and potatoes and things like that. And then a whole roll of chili, so all of these, these beautiful preserves that my mother made. And so I can remember as a child, I got to help make the preserves. And so did our um, black cat called Blackie. <laughs> oh, yeah. sit in the in the window in the kitchen with a view over the uh, the garden and to be cut to be with my mother and me while we were helping make the chili sauce and I can remember chopping the onions and then preparing the jars because these are the jars that would have been would have used they're crown jars and this one is actually from you can tell 1936 there's a, there's a date on the bottom of, of, of a certain period and I would be, I was, my job was to dip the red um, rubber ring uh, in hot water to soften it and then to put it on the, and put it on the top of the, the jar. And then there was a glass top and then a screw band like that. So it was, it was just like a, a current jar, of, of, uh, um, what they now call mason jars. I always called them crown jars. They had these beautiful crown on the front. And, um, I still love to preserve these. This is some Seville orange marmalade. My mother was very fond of making marmalade. And uh, so I think it's, I, every year I make 50 or 60 jars of marmalade. And I think of my mother when, I, when I'm doing it because I certainly had uh, good uh, instructions from her. But I wanna just go back to Blackie the cat for a moment because lying up on top of the, the windowsill was this black cat who, as we were chopping the onions, a lot, of, a lot of onions and chili sauce, and tears streaming down out of his eyes, but he didn't leave. So anyway, that's, that's, the, that's the one of my loves, which, and my mother was such a good preserver, and we had such a fabulous garden. We'd go and pick the, the cucumbers in the morning and make a jar of dill pickles. The dill pickles always were in the large jars like this, all, all the crown jars. And then the things like chili sauce were in these smaller pint jars. So, 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 so that, um, I, preserving was one of the things my mother shared with me in which I was very happy that she did because as you're chopping up and, and measuring out 
there's a lot of talk goes on and that's very nice to have that kind of feeling of intimacy in the kitchen with someone you, you, you know you're going to, you're doing it because you want it and you know that everyone's going to enjoy it and i still love chili sauce on grilled cheese sandwich i think that's a quintessential comfort food to <laughs> but, um, but my mother also um there was one period in my life which um I thought was quite, was part of my mother, you know, a, a post-war affluence, affluence in, in, yes. in, in Canada. And we had a stove like this. Oh. So this was, it was, a, it was, it was quite, took up a lot of room in the kitchen. And our kitchen was very small. And it took up a lot of room. It was a, bigger, a bit bigger than this, but it was this style with the oven on this side and, and, the, and the burners on this side. And um, in, in the early 50s, we got a new stove, a new stove that was a Moffat stove. They were still making stoves in Canada then. And, uh, and a Moffat cookbook, which has the best recipe for um, date and nut loaf. And we still make it and I still make it. So that, that particular, that was an impetus, an encouragement for us to, to cook more and especially to bake more because the, the modern ovens were amazing. So, um, and that, that takes me to something that my mother gave me. And that's this, I'm gonna hold it up so you can see. It's a cake stand, it's in the pattern. This was what my mother put all the birthday cakes on. Although my sister and I were both born at Christmas and we never had birthday cakes. We had Christmas cake. Can I have a piece of cake? Yeah, this is a, this is a cake actually from uh, a historic cookbook that Mary Williamson is editing. And it's called A Plum Cake. And it, it's Mrs. Delgaren's recipe. It's called, so it's in her book, Practice of Cookery. So you're driving me crazy looking at that. Well, it's really nice. And then there are some little macaroons. So uh, having a cake, you always had to have a cake in the house. And I know Edna Stabler talks about that, having to have a cake in the house. So there's always a cake in the house. Uh, and it could, all, if it was nice, it would be on this. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. This is a pressed glass. My mother loved glass and, and china. And, uh, so I'm very honored to have her press. It's a, called a beaded, a beaded band. It's ovals. Anyway, I'm very pleased with this. And it always comes out when we have company in some form or another. Sometimes I put a little tart on the top. Sometimes I put, you know, a pyramid of, of cookies. And sometimes it's actually a cake. But um, so that, that's something that my mother gave me that reminds me of how much she loved to bake and what a good baker she was. She would make butter tarts. And they would be in these little... And these little, um, they're shallow, they're real tart tins. And this is one of her tart tins, although I can't imagine why it's so clean. She must have cleaned it up. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's a real tart tin and butter tarts were her specialty. Oh, love and, butter tarts. Uh, yeah, and my father, the rule in the house was my father would come in from whatever he was doing and he would uh, watch my mother uh, take the butter tarts out of the tins. And if it broke, he got to eat it. So. Anyway, my, <laughs> my father loved tarts. My mother loved my father. My mother made tarts for my father. So, so that's, a, that's a nice thing. Now, I have to say that one of the other things that my mother gave me, although this was a bit, she actually gave it to my sister. And oh, look at that. Potato masher and it's green, Perfect. it's painted green. And this is when they actually thought about people actually mashing potatoes because it's got a rounded wood handle you can see a little bit of the green, but not much. So that when you're mashing the potatoes, you don't get, um, you don't get some spiky thing getting into your, the palm of your hand. This is, this is made for mashing and it's, it's very comfortable in your hand and it makes very good mashed potatoes. Isn't that nice? It's made Ergonomic. Yeah. yeah. So even like back in the thirties when she got married. The other thing that, that she gave me, which, um, uh, she had got one from her father-in-law and that is a hammer because every woman has to have a hammer in the kitchen <laughs> when you when you got to fix a nail or something so this is part of the of the drawer and this was especially from my mother and my well my father too because it was probably one of his hammers and <laughs> the kitchen because you, you never know when you're going to need it now um uh, i would say uh, we we did have a lot of cookbooks my mother read ladies home um Ladies' Home Journal. Yes. And um, uh, we, did, we weren't into the gourmet uh, magazine. Um, but so anyway, but we did have a recipe box. And I think recipe boxes are like a treasure. Oh, that's a beauty. 
Some of the people have a drawer into which they threw all of their recipes and clippings. Well, my mother has more than one of, the, of these things. But it, to me, it's like going down memory lane because yeah. the fruit salad my, my mother wrote it in her hand. And oh. it's, it's, uh, you maybe remember oh. it's got sugar and, it's sugar and vinegar. It's a, a sweet salad dressing which you, um, into which you mix whipped cream and you served it on fruit salad when the ladies came over. And at Christmas time, we always had a turnip casserole with apples, um, and that was that was our traditional uh, turn, turnip uh, recipe. My mother also loved a, a, a food writer called Mary Moore. And um, in, whenever when I'm looking at my mother's things, I always find clippings of Mary Moore. And on the back of it is our interesting directory from the Stratford Beacon Herald. But this was for uh, Glenn uh, Hurst uh, orange cheesecake. So it's smooth as velvet, it says. Uh, and then sometimes I find my father's, my father's hand, which I always like, love to see. So, and that's for fruit marmalade. Uh, and, um, and then here's something from a neighbor, uh, well, Ollie Wilker, who lived next door to us. And it's her scotch oat cakes. So um. sort of like it brings out uh, feelings of the, our kitchen, my mother and father's um, love of cooking and eating, and, and uh, the things that they look for sources, and, and um, just all the nice things that make living um, with, with, you know, with a, a food-obsessed family. I say, when we all got together, and my mother was one of eight, it was always a big, it was always, it was always a lot of going on, but we never danced. We didn't, uh, we didn't play cards. We didn't sing around the piano. We just ate. And <laughs> so anyway, um, but I think um, one of the, um, I was very lucky to have done a cookbook back in 1974 when my mother was still in her prime. She died in 88, but she was in her prime and, and I needed help because of the, um, the, uh, my publisher, Jim Laura, was going to get me. I was, I was in big trouble if I didn't get the the recipes finished. And so my mother came down from Stratford to Toronto to um, help me get finish off. And that was one oh, of the nice. It was wonderful, a wonderful yeah. week with her. And she oh. talked about recipes her mother made. And uh, there was a famous orange cake that everyone in our family made. And uh, her, her sisters and her sister-in-laws made it. And she helped me with my first book, which was- Oh, called. I got that. <laughs> Oh, and on the, on the page uh, 55, it was by the seasons, in the summer season, there was something called Hellfire Salad. And this was, uh, I think, the only, I can't think of it, it had anything called that name. I'd never seen in the cookbook of that era. In fact, our next door neighbors, who were very lovely ladies, um, uh, said that they wouldn't call it Hellfire Salad. It was just hot salad. But oh. it was, it was hot tomatoes and cucumber, some green pepper, some slivered red hot pepper, and some fresh basil or savory or margarine, and then a kind of vinaigrette on it. So that's Hellfire Salad from Classic Canadian Cooking. So, so that I made spring tarragon chicken from that book. Oh, oh, well, there's some good recipes in there, John. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, then I, and then I, and then I, and then I wrote, um, again with my mother's help, um, oh, this is, uh, you can see how decrepit it is. This is the, this is the uh, uh, apples, peaches, uh, peach, apples, peaches, and pears. And in it is Olive Davis. My mother's name was Olive Davis. And oh. her peach, um, schnitz peach pie. It's a Dutch apple pie made with peaches, big chunks of peaches. And because we're so close to the Niagara Peninsula, we have this incredible fruit here in, in Ontario. And so that's, that's, a great, that's also a great recipe if you haven't tried that. And then in here, is uh, this is in summer berries again uh, you know falling apart and what i love about cookbooks is when things fall out other recipes and little yeah. pieces and comments um anyway this uh, this one is a four fruit july jam it's something sometimes called jewel jam but it has raspberries um stemmed red currants uh which would have come from our garden uh green gooseberries which came from our garden and pitted sour cherries and it it cooks up the cherries make it tart and the gooseberries make it tart and also have the pectin and it's a wonderful ontario recipe that uh i'm so pleased to have um have my mother so, Isn't so that nice? i overwhelmed you with how wonderful no i love it i love it i love it. we've chatted before and and you told me about your aunts well yes i had 
My mother was one of four girls, and with four, there were four girls and four boys, and it was a bit of a matriarchy. Uh, and um, Aunt Bessie was the oldest, and she was definitely the boss. <laughs> she made the best pickles because she had a well. She lived in Siebenville, which was five miles west of Stratford. I know where that is, yeah. And also with a big garden and whatnot. But she made the best, uh, um, very uh, Indian-style curd, curd pickles that, we, that oh, yes. I, I, I have in the classic Canadian cooking. Uh, and then was my Aunt Helen, who lived in Mitchell, also had a big garden, and, and she made the best rhubarb pie. Mm. That rhubarb pie, which is, seems to be fairly concentrated in southwestern Ontario, and it's um, rhubarb uh, egg. There's no, no cream or milk in it, although uh, the version I have in one of my books is, does actually have it. But basically the egg and the juice from the rhubarb makes this succulent, uh, and a little bit of sugar, because you have to have a little bit of sugar in there. Uh, it makes a really, really lovely pie, and Aunt Helen made the best. So anyway, so, and they, and they did a lot of things together. They were, the, my aunt um, Agnes, or Aunt Mickey, lived in New York. She married, she married a guy from London who was the brother of one of the people in the Guy Lombardo band. And when they went to New York, they followed them. And so we didn't see much of Aunt Mickey, although she did introduce chili to us one time when she came up from New York, because we didn't grow up with chili. It wasn't until Aunt Mickey came up from New York and showed us how to make chili. Anyway, so the, but the, it was, there were three aunts who all uh, were great cooks and very hospitable. And in farming, the, following the farming tradition is that you would, you would be doing something and you go into somebody's house and if it was mealtime, you automatically got fed. It was just, uh, it was, well, you were there and then there's food. So you, you, joined, you joined the family and it was a very nice custom, uh, farm custom in, in, in Ontario and, uh, and elsewhere I know. Very nice. So Elizabeth, we're coming up to uh, uh, the, about the last 10 minutes of our, our chat here. I'm, I wonder if people have questions, Julia. Yes, we do have a few questions. Um, a couple of them relate to marmalade, Elizabeth. Oh. <laughs> um, um, what your mother used to make it. Where, did she ha get Seville oranges or carrots or pumpkin with a lemon or two? And related question is, where can I find Seville oranges? I live in Michigan and I can never find them. So uh, I, I don't think you can, you will find them because it, they are truly seasonal. Um, and they, and they originally came from Se Seville. They were a bitter orange, which was the, the first orange. Uh, and um, so you would have to look, start looking in the middle or the near the beginning of January and with your produce um, manager and, and ask to have them, uh, for, for him to order it because this year I, I knew I should be finding oranges and I couldn't and so I, I talked to the um, produce manager and and he got them in from for me he said well they're out at the the uh, uh, Ontario food terminal I just have to get them and he did so especially if you're living in some place like um, Michigan where there may not be quite a strong a British um, uh, background um, so uh, that would be my advice um, and uh, persist is, is really what it was because when I first started making marmalade, you, you, you had hardly any opportunity to buy them. But this is a bit funny because I once went in, in May to Seville for a little bit of a holiday and the, the trees on the street are all Seville orange trees and they're <gasps> loaded with oranges. And, oh. <laughs> okay, now, and now my, mo the, the, my mother's marmalade, um, this was something that, as, as not when I was a little girl, but they were as a because we made um, we made peach marmalade, which had oranges and lemon in it, uh, and um, I don't remember ever making that carrot orange marmalade that was so popular. But we did make a, a, a medley marmalade of um, grapefruit, orange, and lemon, and that, that you didn't have to have Seville's to make that. So that was what we did. And then my sister moved to Vancouver, where there's a big marmalade community there and she taught my mother and me how to make Seville orange marmalade and uh and then when my mother and father were spending time in Florida they got on to calamondins which are a sour orange very small mm. but like a, like a, like a, a clementine or a tangerine and bitter uh and they make the absolutely best marmalade in the whole world better than Seville's it has more flavor but you can't get them and I, I 
I did get some from uh, Bob Bloomer a few years ago, but um, anyway, that you for civils persist, ask, and you'll never turn back to anything other than that. They make it. <laughs> wonderful. Um, and a, re a related question, more canning preserving. And um, I I grew up not not too far from where Elizabeth did, and. Uh, so I am also a chili sauce aficionado. My mother still makes it, but we do have a question from someone who has never had chili sauce. And can you describe it? What exactly is in it? Well, it's a lot like salsa, only it's sweeter. Um, and uh, it's, it's not quite as hot, although there always has to be one hot pepper in it. But it's a combination of onions, tomatoes, peppers, celery, uh, vinegar, uh, sugar, and, and then a combination of, of mixed spices, which you would buy and, and put in a little um, uh, cheesecloth bag in, into, the, uh, into the mixture and you boil it down. So when it's, it's, it's boiling, you get this wonderful fragrance of, of vinegar and tomatoes. And um, it's, it's, it's definitely the perfect companion of something cheesy or um, to go with, uh, um, to go with any kind of roast meat, uh, I it's I know it's an old-fashioned flavor, but but if you make if you make salsa, it's very it's almost the same. Only there's no coriander and there's not as much pepper, and, and certainly instead of a cup of sugar, there's like a tablespoon of sugar just to take the edge off. Right. Anyway, I like I like them both, but chili sauce is in my veins. Yeah. <laughs> now here's an interesting question. Um, what modern cooking innovation do you think your mother would enjoy most and which one would she like the least? Hmm. Hmm. I don't think she'd be keen on the, um, uh, the, the, um, when you have the, 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 the rod into your pan and it heats the water to a certain temperature and keeps it there, it's sous vide. I don't think she'd be very, very impressed with sous vide, mm. but I know that she would, uh, what would she really love? She always had good knives. Um, she might like non-stick things because then you don't have to you know, paint your pan with butter and then put in the flour and, and tap it all around. But uh, that might be something she, she, would, she would like. I'm sure she would have really enjoyed making pastry in a food processor because she made great pastry and I'm sure she would have risen to the challenge of doing it. She made fabulous tea biscuits, but um, anyway, that's, that's, away from, that's away from the point. John, what would your mother have liked the most? Oh, she made everything. She uh, made um, Italian food, Japanese food, Chinese food. I can't even pick one. She, she would go to a restaurant and just decompose, try and analyze what was in it, and then go home right away and start cooking up and chopping up and everything was in steam. It was, it was great. Oh my goodness. Well, that's, that's, that's the story of most of our lives, I think. Yes. Um, and, and one more question here. It's interesting. It relates to that wonderful recipe box you showed us. Um, and um, Judy is curious about the motivation uh, that makes a good cook write something down um, when she knows the recipe really well and could do it with her eyes closed, such as the turnip casserole recipe. Um, maybe there is an element of wanting to record it for the next generation. What do you think? Well, I, I, I think the first, the first trigger is, is tasting something that you know is really delicious and well-made. Um, uh, I, I think my mother would have done that. And then, you know, when she was, my mother was a nurse and she worked all the time I was growing up. Um, she would taste things at the hospital or some of the other people in the hospital would share their recipes. So I think she was writing that down to remember that person as well as the recipe. I, I don't think they were thinking about passing things on to my sister or me, although um, I'm, I know that she did pass a lot of things uh, on, but I don't think that was the intention. I think it was more, it was going the other way, the person who had given her the recipe or shared the recipe or the tasting. So that was more her motivation. Lovely, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, and that's nice because then you're remembering 
perhaps that person as well. And some of those manuscript cookbooks, people do write Mrs. So-and-so's recipe because they want to um, acknowledge where they got it. And uh, yeah, that's lovely. And that so, makes a community around, uh, it's a community around the cookbook and are, uh, are, are precious. Um, but um, my Aunt Bessie, her group in Sebringville, um, they did a really wonderful cookbook that had the, the pastor's uh, sponge cake, which became a, a family classic uh, in it. And also, you know, a recipe for um, uh, tomato and meatball sauce, which was quite innovative in 1957. That people were make, having uh, spaghetti and meatballs in basically a, a German and British community. Wow. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more question here. And uh, Anik would like to know, um, so which recipes in classic Canadian cooking, um, you have your mother's and your aunt's recipes in, in that uh, cookbook, is that right? Yes, I did. Actually, her chili sauce is in, is in here, and oh. her mustard pickles. Um, there were uh, things like um, potato bread, um, uh, there, there was a, a really interesting spiced beef that people don't do very much anymore, but you could buy that around New Year's in Stratford. Um, the, the classic strawberry shortcake, which is a, a rich, um, a rich uh, biscuit with uh, strawberries that are macerated in sugar with a little bit of vanilla. And the meringue shells, we always had, we often had meringue shells, especially in the summer when we had special, we had, um, when we had uh, uh, lots of fresh f fruit. Um, uh, the one thing that we didn't have, which was, it's interesting because it was part of our family tradition was to go out and pick berries and apples in the fall along the, the road when you'd get the wild apples with the special flavors. We never did buttered fiddle, fiddleheads because we didn't have any fresh fiddleheads until I started working on, on classic Canadian cooking. So that's definitely not my mother's. Um, but something that um, bespeaks uh, the community that we lived, that we lived in is the dandelion salad with bacon mm. and sour cream dressing. And there were our neighbors who actually had dandelions which were covered up with straw. They grew dandelions in, the, in their garden as opposed to in their lawn. And uh, having those kind of German flavors of bacon and sour cream. Um, so, uh, oh, my mother made the most fabulous floating island. She was very ambitious when it came to things like that. Um, so there are lots of recipes in here that are from the peach chutney, for example, the mint and apple jelly, the mustard beans, the pickled beets. We were great on pickled beets because you always had a ton of beets in the garden. Um, and um, the chili sauce, as I said before, the black currant jelly, we had a, a black currant uh, bush in our backyard. And so we always had to make jelly, which was, was just wonderful, and the bread and butter pickles. So, and my mother told me about the bread and butter pickles. The recipe came from um, uh, my father's cousin's wife, who had been a home child and had come to Canada as an orphan and worked in, lived in a farm close to actually where my mother grew up. And she made the best bread and butter pickles. So my mother shared that recipe with me, which I think I'm very proud of. Um, now, I don't know whether you ever made baked beans at home. Did, did your mother make bread, baked beans, Julia or, or John? Yeah, no, my mom still makes baked beans, yeah. yes. So they, that's something that, that we, we did together. And of course, the classic oatmeal cookies here are my grandmother's, because that was one of the recipes my mother shared when she came down to Toronto to work with me as we were, I, we were finishing up the book. And she told me, my, and my, my mother also did something her, grand, her mother did, was just to make dates, make a date, kind of a date puree you cook with sugar and water and sometimes a little bit of lemon or orange. And that makes a lovely filling for oatmeal cookies. And, but instead of having 60 cookies, you only have 30 big fat cookies. But that was, a, that was a very nice thing that she made. The split pea and ham soup, those are, um, those are all things my mother made. Um, oh, 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 it's so nice to, look at these things and think of my parents. Um, my mother made something classic potato soup, which they used to eat on the farm. And um, it's basically just butter and onion. 
And then if you have some bacon or some ham, you put that in. And then you um, stew that, you stew that for a little while like, and with some chopped uh, potatoes. And then you add, you could add water, you could add chicken stock, you could add a little bit of, of, uh, of uh, milk. No, you don't put the milk until later. And then you cook the potatoes and you don't mash them or you can give them a little bit of a tap. So you, you stick in the liquid and then you put in some light cream or milk and, and sprinkle it with parsley or uh, green onions. That, that was uh, a very nice thing to make. And I make that, I've used that a number of times when somebody wants a really simple soup. We served it actually in Campbell House. My father loved mince meat, so we actually used his, his mother's recipe for the mince meat. Um, and, uh, and when we were having company, my mother always served, or she liked to serve, pork tenderloin, and she would stuff them with a sage and currant stuffing with breadcrumbs. And that was really very special. And uh, um, so that her recipe is in there as well. Uh, so this balls all the way through this, our favorite, oh, here's the New Year's buffet is where the spiced beef is. And I'm serving that with an assortment of green tomato pickle. That was from George and my husband's mother, peach chutney, chili sauce, uh, bread and butter pickles and mustard beans. That would have been a very colorful platter. You know, when people were having company, you would admit you'd have the roast or the chicken or the pork tenderloin or whatever, and you would have a relish tray that would include all of these special pickles that would be chosen for the, their crunch and their color and their flavor. And then as we got into the 60s, we started having uh, dips and, and, and fresh vegetables to dip into that. Um, and you may not I mean, you may remember the story of when Maureen Mateer served uh, crudite with a dip and, and she was chastised for serving raw vegetables to people and some, such an, um, a, about, uh, it is such a bad idea that you should be serving raw vegetables only for it to be like the biggest fad of the 50s and 70s. So she, she was so right and so ahead of things. Yes. Anyway. Um, so, Yay, Maureen. Yeah. So in the meantime, that's great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Oh my Please God. stay well. Please stay strong. And happy cooking. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. everybody. Thank you.